Good morning, everyone. If everyone want to come on inside, we'll get started with our worship this morning. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Welcome to the LJ Church of Christ. No other place in the on the face of this earth that we need to be is right here worshiping God with our brothers and sisters. Um, you know, we come together every Sunday to worship and give God the respect and, and worship that he deserves. But we also come to be encouraged. And I just want to take a minute and read this card that I was just handed a few minutes ago. It's from uh, Keith Brown. And I was, I was reading it just before we came in here. I felt encouraged. And I want to share that with you at this time to show how much of an encouragement that this church has been to him and his family. But as I read this, think about the encouragement that you get from the reading of this card. Janice, Janice and I walked into this church seven months ago and were amazed by all the wonderful people that went out of their way to make sure that we felt welcome and comfortable. We talked about it for days and couldn't wait for the next Sunday to arrive. The L.J. Church of Christ had changed our life forever. I'm so grateful that the Lord led us here. I have never met so many loving and caring people in my life. I can't say thank you enough for the calls, texts, prayers, visits, and especially the offers to help my wife Janice to take care of the cattle and horses during my sickness. I have truly been blessed to have you people in my life. I will never forget you, you beautiful people of God. Thank you, Keith. We are so thankful, Keith, that you're here with us this morning. And we thank you for your encouragement as we begin to worship our God this morning. I do want to ask you to stand as we read the scripture this morning. We'll be reading Psalms 86 and verse 12. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Amen. Please remain standing for this first song. We'll sing 578. We will glorify. <clears throat> we will glorify.
our Lord and Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Lord today that you've brought us here together and given us the ability to come here and worship you. Lord, we thank you for all the things in our life, uh, the small moments that we have, the happiness of our families, uh, and more importantly, the hope that we have to be with you in heaven. Lord, we ask this morning that as we assemble here together and listen to the message that will be delivered to us, that something in our hearts might be opened up and, uh, or some change that we need to make might be found in the words. Dear Lord, we thank you for your son dying on the cross and giving us the ability to be with you in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 6, picking up the theme of 3, says, God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for many, the testimony given at the proper time. Jesus redeemed us like somebody buying a slave. He bought us with his blood. The blood cleanses us from sin and unrighteousness. So Jesus owns us. But what are the benefits of that redemption? If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 15, the first thing uh, we'd, we'd like to talk about is inheritance. Starting in verse 13, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works and to serve the living God? For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We want that inheritance, and that's one of the things that we're 
remembering about what he did for us. The second thing, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 3, we're going to do selected verses from Romans 3, 4, and 5. The word is justification. What is justification? Justification is mankind being put right with God because of what Jesus has done. Someone one time said, justified, justified, never done it. It puts us back in the right, right relationship. So in Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, there is no distinction for all of sin to fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, again there's our word, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as an atoning sacrifice in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting, it is excluded. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Skipping down to Romans 4, in the first part of the verse, Paul is talking about Abraham and his faith in God, and he transitions more into, again, this justification um, that, that takes place, starting in verse 20. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God has promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because of our justification. Romans chapter 5, continuing the thought about justification, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Skipping down to 9 through 11. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. You'll skip down to verse 15. But, if the free, but the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, many die, being Adam, much more did the grace of God and the gift of the grace by the man Jesus Christ abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then... As through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that transgression would increase, but where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how are we going to apply this justification, the thing, that we're, the, the thing that Jesus did for us that we're celebrating right now? 
First, we've got to recognize the cost of what, what happened. God in the flesh walked this earth. He suffered humiliation. He suffered death on the cross. And he did that to free us from our sins. Second, understanding the goal of justification is the ability to once again have a relationship with God. This relationship is based on love and not fear of punishment. So as we get ready to partake of this communion, let's focus our thoughts on the cost and let's thank God for his plan of salvation and thank Jesus for everything that he went through for you and for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you recognizing that we're sinners. And Lord, we ask that as we enter into this time of communion that you would forgive us of our sins. And Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to realize the cost of what was done for us. And Lord, as we partake of the bread, we're remembering Jesus' body, that he came to earth. He left the glory of heaven because we needed him. And Lord, he came and he walked this earth. He knows what it's like to be human. And he suffered. So Lord, we pray that as we partake of this, we keep that in our mind. We pray our partaking is in accordance to you. And we thank you so much for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name. Let's continue our thanks to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we continue in thanks and we continue in remembrance of your plan to save us. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus, the temptations he went through, the, the, the way that he was treated on this earth. We remember all of that and Lord, we remember that in the end he was crucified and that the blood that was shed was shed for each one of us. Lord, we thank you for this emblem of the fruit of the vine. Something so simple that can remind us of that blood that was shed. Lord, as we are partaking, help us to keep that in the forefront of our minds. Help us to focus on that and come to you humbly with the, the, the right spirit of thankfulness and excitement that Jesus paid it all for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
been to gather around and commune with each other and commune with our Lord and remember the sacrifice that he, he did for us all those years ago. With the communion being concluded, we take the opportunity to partake in another act of worship, which is our contribution, our giving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And any gift that we would give back to him is really just a mere token of the thanks for the eternal gift that he's given us. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then over in Mark 12, starting verse 42, it says, A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which will amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this widow put in more than all the, contrib the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she owned, all she had to live on. God doesn't want our money. He doesn't need our money. He can accomplish anything. You know, what little we have is not going to make a difference. God does want your heart. He had the widow's heart. That's evidenced by the story written down about her giving. Does he have your heart? So as we pray for the contribution, let's remember everything that we've been given by God. Let's examine ourselves and let's get our hearts right. And let's give um, in a, uh, a right manner as God would want us to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Again, we thank you for all you've done for us. You provided a way to save our souls from eternal death. You've blessed us that we have been born and we live in the country that we live in. Lord, most of us have more than an abundance of our needs. We thank you for that. We thank you for our jobs. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for the clothes that we have and the ready access to read your word anytime. Lord, you've blessed us so much. Lord, we're about to give a portion of that back to you from our hearts. And Lord, I pray that all of us would give liberally, that we would give happily because we know that you gave everything to us first. Lord, we love you and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen.
this morning I'll be reading from John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place.
Well, good morning. It is uh, such a blessing to see everybody here today. I look around, we have some visitors with us. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please fill out a visitor's card. You can just hand it to somebody on your way out the door just so we can have a record of you being here and show you uh, how much we appreciate you being with us and being part of our uh, service today. There's a lot of things going on uh, today, youth activity this afternoon, and um, just a, a lot of excitement. And then we are two weeks away, I know it seems strange, from Friends and Family Day. So be inviting folks I know there's um, some digital flyers being passed around on social media. I think there's some physical ones out there. Um, so make sure you are inviting folks to that. That will be the beginning of our spring revival. Looking forward to that. Um, so we'll have Friends and Family Day on Sunday. And then um, as we go throughout the week, we'll have Josh Cantrell with us on Monday from Avondale, who always does a great job. We'll have um, John Podine from over at Calhoun with us on Tuesday. And then Kyle Rye from Buford will close us out uh, on Wednesday. Um, we had a, a little bit of a, a scheduling boo-boo with um, Northside down in Jasper. We try to alternate weeks of meetings, and we ended up scheduling those the same week. And so um, we uh, are going to try on Sunday afternoon. So we'll have our service here about 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And on Sunday afternoon, Jasper is going to meet at 4.30, and Spencer Hall is going to be doing that meeting. So I told him to make sure he saved his best sermon for that time. And so we're going to take the van down, and anybody that would like to go meet us down there and support Spencer and support the church down there in their revival. You're expected to be here every other time, but if you want to go and support Spencer, we, uh, we, we always want to do that as well. And so that's, um, that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Lots of uh, exciting things to be um, taken care of there. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Open them up to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. We're going to start uh, in chapter 8 there in just a minute. We, uh, in our Bible class this morning, uh, are studying, started studying through the book of Judges. And we're just doing a, a survey on Sunday mornings. We call it Bible by the Book. Just looking at each book of the Bible uh, in the order that we have it in our um, Christian Bible. And just sort of going through and looking at it. And the book of Judges is a, is a pretty dark time. Uh, the Iron Age of Israel, it's called, where um, they went through a lot of punishment and a lot of struggles and a lot of difficulties. Then after the book of Judges, you get to the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, the very last passage is this weird family tree. You've got this, this great love story from the book of Ruth, uh, you know, and then the story of Ruth and Boaz and, and the kinsman redeemer and how uh, the loyalty that Ruth had to her mother-in-law and all the things that are associated with that story. But then at the very end, you get this little family tree. And it's about Ruth and Boaz, and about Obed, and about a guy named Jesse, and about this guy named David. And then the book ends. It says that, that David is the son of Jesse, and that's, that's the end of the book. But it's there at the end of the, the book of Ruth that we start to get a glimmer of what God has in mind for his people. He's going to allow them one day down the line to have a king, David. And we know that through the line of David, we're going to get our king, Jesus. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at uh, the story of Israel choosing a king. And then I want us to help uh, for just a minute, think about the king that we choose in our lives as well. And, and hopefully we'll be able to make good choices for that. And so uh, after we get to the book of uh, Judges, and, and we get that little story there in Ruth, uh, we get here to the, the story of, of Samuel. And uh, in the original Hebrew Bible, I know most of you are aware that First and Second Samuel were one book. First and Second Kings were one book. They were long narratives. But in our Christian Bible, they've been broken up to help us sort of absorb them into First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. But uh, here in First Samuel, we get the story of Israel wanting a king. There's a lot of different reasons that Israel demanded a king, but the Bible says that there are at least three of them. Excuse me. So we're going to start reading uh, in verse 1 of 1 Samuel 8, if you have your Bibles. It says, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and 
perverted justice. And so all the uh, elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. They're going to say the same thing when you get down to verse uh, 20. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us, to go out before us and to fight our battles. The, the first reason that they wanted a king was so that they could be like all of the nations around them. Now, this had to be troubling to God to hear this, right? Because God has set up this nation of chosen people and their big statement of wanting a king is so they can be like every other nation around them. second reason they want a king is in a lot of ways they had rejected God is their king. Start, look at verse 6. They said, give us a king to lead us. And this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected. But they have rejected me as their king. And he goes on to say, <clears throat> it's not something new. They did it uh, from the time that they came up, came up out of Egypt. They have rejected me. And then the third reason <clears throat> that we read down in verse 20, they wanted somebody else to fight their battles. Look at verse 20 again. We'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. <clears throat> Israel's king that they wanted here was someone to lead them because they didn't want to follow God. They didn't want to trust God's appointed leader. They wanted to be like all the other nations around them with their powerful kings that could flaunt their wealth and their authority. And they wanted somebody to fight their battles for them. They didn't have the courage to go out and fight as God had directed them. <clears throat> and so they're going to get their king. Israel wanted a king. And so let's look at the king they get there starting in chapter 9. He seems like... Um, the perfect guy. Seems like the perfect guy. Starting in, uh, in verse 2. It says there in verse 1, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. But <clears throat> Kish, his father, had a son named Saul. As handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. Israel said, we have found the guy. He's from the right lineage. He looks the part. He's going to be important. He is going to be our king. They chose him based on superficial circumstances and a superficial identity, and he became a failure as king. Israel wanted somebody to play the part. They wanted somebody that looked the part. They wanted somebody who that, that they could look at and say, this is our guy. He's a, he's a leader. He's, he's awesome. He's powerful. Look at him. And very shortly, God rejects him. And instead, God is going to choose the king that he wants. Turn over just a few chapters to chapter 16. Starting in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse at Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. And Saul, or excuse me, Samuel is obviously afraid that Saul will kill him, but he does anyway, and he goes through, and, and they go through all the different sons, right? And so starting in verse 6, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. Listen to this now. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel, but Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one. And on down the line, and then you get down and they say, Well, there's one more. And so he sent for him in verse 12. This is David and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. 
in the very next chapter, the entirety of the nation of Israel is going to meet the Lord's anointed. And when the great Philistine giant standing at nearly 10 feet tall stands at one end of the valley of Elah and says, who is going to fight for the nation of Israel? And it's David, the little shepherd boy who comes up with, with no armor on and nothing but the little stones and a sling and one little stone right into the forehead of the giant fells him. He decapitates the giant and walks around with his head and says that God defeated this uncircumcised Philistine. And we learn who God's king is going to be. But listen, if it wasn't for God making it abundantly clear, he never would have been the king. David was not the king that the people wanted. He didn't look the part. He wasn't big. He wasn't exceptionally handsome. He didn't look like somebody that would be a warrior. He didn't look like the king that he wanted. But David is called a man after God's own heart. And that is what God looked at when he was looking for a king. And so David goes on to rule in, in Judah and eventually he becomes the king of the United Nation and then he lives a, a long life, although it's full of mistakes as we can read about. But his, he goes on to die and he leaves behind a son named Solomon. He is the son of David and Bathsheba and Solomon goes on to be the king. I read a list the other day of the, the top ten kings in the history of of the world and Solomon not David is listed as one of the top 10 greatest kings in the history of the world well why well because he was wealthy because he was powerful because he built the temple but really if you go back and look it has to be David who's considered the world's greatest king not because of his accomplishments but because of the heart I wish I could tell you that after Solomon on down the line, the lineage of David continued to rule on the throne of Israel. But you know that story. That the kings eventually rebelled. That starting with Solomon's son, there was essentially civil war in Israel. Starting with Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And the people had to choose a king, whether they were going to be part of the southern tribes and the nation of Judah serving those kings or whether they were going to be part of the northern tribes, Israel with its capital in Samaria. If you go read the books of the kings, there are 40 kings in total. 20 in the north and 20 in the south. And out of those 40, only 8 are remembered as even remotely good kings. You've got the Josiahs and the Hezekiahs and those people that occasionally stand up. But ultimately... The history of Israel's monarchy is sad. And it's in 722 B.C., I believe, that the Assyrians come and conquer the northern tribes and carry them away. And then it's in 587 or 586 B.C. that the Babylonians come in and they carry the nation of Judah off into captivity under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. And so we're left with a story of failed kings of a monarchy that, that collapsed. And eventually they, they go back to Israel, but the nation itself never rules with the same power and fervor again. And by the time we get to the New Testament and we read about it, the, the Israelites are ruled by client kings of Rome. And so we're here today, and, and Damien read for us a few minutes ago that we're part of a kingdom that is not of this world. But we are part of a kingdom. I hope we know that. When we become a Christian and we give our lives to Christ, when we come out of that water, the Bible says that the Lord adds us to his church, and it is the church that we're a part of that is the kingdom of God. And make no mistake, there is a king. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the king that we are to serve. The Bible calls him a, a lot of things. You read the book of Revelation, he's referred to repeatedly there as king. Isaiah calls him the, the wonderful counselor, the everlasting, uh, the, the prince of peace. He has a lot of different titles, but we are of the kingdom that belongs to him. 
That's why when he was on trial before Pilate right there, Pilate asked him, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? And he says, you, you've said I'm a king, but I'm a king of a, a spiritual kingdom. And so that choice falls to us today. And this is not going to be a long lesson or a, even a very deep lesson. It's going to be a lesson about choices, about choices. If you go through and you start reading about some of the most powerful kings in history, you'll come upon people like Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, by the time he was 30 years old, had nearly conquered the whole world. In fact, he would die just a short time later. You'll read about <coughs> people like Louis XIV of France or Henry VIII of, of England, who's famous for all his wives. I, I think if I was a woman and I'd already seen him behead one wife, I don't think I'd be standing in line for the next wedding ring, that's just me, but you'll read about people like Genghis Khan, who was one of the most wise and yet vicious military leaders of all time. You'll read about other great political figures, you'll read about great presidents of the United States, you can go read about uh, George Washington, who, 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 who crossed the river and, and won our nation's freedom became our first president. You read about people like Abraham Lincoln or like Thomas Jefferson or like uh, Roosevelt that are, that are on the Mount Rushmore who literally are remembered as the four pillars. Now, Roosevelt kind of is on there because he's the one that commissioned the project. He's still a great president, Teddy, but you know, we can remember all these great people and all these great leaders and all these wonderful presidents and, and emperors and, and leaders. You go back to, to Augustus Caesar in Rome and all these great people. They were leaders who were judged by the standards of men. You and I today, when we're choosing who to follow, we do not look at what the world looks at. We look at not only the heart, but we look at who has saved us, and that's Jesus. And he, he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the Prince of peace. He is the, the worthy lamb. He is the sacrifice for our sins. He is our atoning sacrifice. He is so many things, but the question that I ask myself and that I ask you this morning he is all those things but is he the king of my life we sing a song sometimes and I was trying to remember the name of it this morning and it, and it came to me it's uh, lead me to Calvary the very first line of that song do you remember those of you that are older we don't sing it that much anymore the very first line of that song says king of my life I crown thee now thine shall the glory be and so I want to ask us this morning, uh, who is the king of our life? Or maybe more importantly for us, what is in control and what is in authority and what sits on the throne of our lives that resides within our heart? Do we serve Jesus or do we serve a career? Do we serve Jesus or do we serve a hobby? Do we serve Jesus as our king or do we serve ourselves? Do we serve our desires and our pleasures and our temptations? Do we, do we serve money? The Bible says very clearly, you got to pick. You can't serve God and, and money. The Bible says the love of money is the, the root of all evil. It doesn't mean it's bad to be financially stable, but, man, if that's my God, if that's my king, then I've missed the point. Today, we have to honestly sit and evaluate and ask this question, what is or who is the king of my life, or maybe more importantly, what is standing in the way of Jesus truly being the king of everything that I am and me serving him with everything that I have. It's not lost on me that this is an election year. You're not going to hear me talk about the candidates. I don't, I don't know. I have a pretty good idea of what's going to end up happening. Uh, but, you know, that, that's for everybody else to decide for themselves. But you know, we've said this before, whoever's sitting in the Oval Office will be a distant second to the man who's reigning on the throne in heaven, and that's Jesus. And so, and so we have to figure out in our lives, 
truly who we're going to follow and, and who is going to be king. I had an illustration that I was going to use to, to close the lesson this morning, but in our Bible class, there was a quote that I shared that ended up stirring up a lot of discussion. And so I want to end by reminding us of that. If you weren't in class, you missed a good discussion. The quote that we read was that human, uh, human failure is certain. There is a certainty of human failure when we disobey God and try to choose what is right for ourselves. I want you to think about that. There is a, there is a certainty of human failure when we try to decide what's right for ourselves and when we disobey God. I'll be honest with you, I'm really guilty of that. I'm really guilty of thinking that I can carve my own path that I can make my own way, I can make my own decisions, and I know what's right, and I know what will yield the best result. And man, if the Lord hasn't humbled me in that in my life. If the Lord hasn't broken me of that. There is a certainty of failure when we try to do things for ourselves or follow somebody that is not God and make someone or something in our life king other than Jesus. But the second half of that quote this morning was that just as certain as our failure is, we can have a certainty of God's favor and blessings and his forgiveness when we have a, a, a repentant heart and we seek him. Whether, whether it's through prayers we discussed this morning or, or through service or through obedience. And so we stand here like we do every Sunday with a choice. We have a choice. Make, make no mistake, this part is not optional. This part is not, I might want to believe this. There is indeed a throne in heaven. And God the Father sits upon it and seated right at his right hand is Jesus. That is, that is an indisputable fact. Just as sure as we're sitting here on these green pews, that is real. Jesus is seated there on the throne. He is the head of this church. He is the king of the kingdom which you and I claim citizenship in. That is an indisputable fact. So the choice is always on us. We have free will to decide who is going to be the ruler of our lives. Well, we bow down before that throne and, and, and do the things that we claim to do. We, we sang two songs today, one in Bible class, Oh, Worship the King. And then the first song that we sang, the very first lyric of it that Jacob led for us says, We will glorify who? The King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, the great I Am. The choice is ours. Will we serve another master or will we serve Jesus as king? This morning the choice is ours. And if you're ready to change your choice, we'd love to help you in that this morning. If there's something that is private between you and God, you have the opportunity to make that right. If there's something public that you would like to make right, we'd, we'd like nothing better than to drop the clicker and be part of that this morning. <laughs> Dave, you didn't even help me. <laughs> We've been blessed um, the last couple of weeks. We've added two new members to our church family. And if there's anything that we would like to do today, it would be to add to that. Now this morning, if you are not a Christian and you'd like to become one, to name the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to repent of your sins and be baptized so that those sins can be forever washed away, we'd love to help you with that. If you have a need to respond this morning, you can come as we stand and sing.
Thank you all for being here. To our guests, thank you for being here. Come back, be with us anytime you can. Um, our online visitors, thank you for joining this morning. Hope you all are well. Uh, today is um, today is our youth lunch and our cemetery cleanup. Uh, that will be followed by a scavenger hunt for our sixth grade and up, and then a movie uh, afternoon for our fifth grade and under. And if you have any questions about that, see uh, Mark and Diane. Um, our prayer request list, uh, guys, if you haven't got a bulletin, be sure to get that. Um, this bulletin is, is used for a lot of things, and there's a lot of effort put into this. Um, these prayer requests are they're serious. They really are. And uh, we need to remember these folks. And sometimes these individuals that are on this list, they, they may be at a, their lowest point. And us as Christians, that's, that's our duty is to help lift them up. And, and let's remember all these. Rachel Hensley uh, had surgery this week. Um, she is um, you know, still in the hospital. And they have asked that uh, she not have visitors at this time. Janetta McCoy, remember Janetta and Tate this week as, as she has surgery. Um, Abby um, will be having some scans this week. Let's uh, especially remember her. Um, Keith Brown, David, uh, David Bailey, Mike Mahaffey, Wendy's dad, uh, he's recovering from, uh, from heart attack. Um, Sadie Lau, who is a, uh, she's a, a local uh, young female here in Ella J. Let's remember her and her family. They're going through a really tough time right now. Of course, always remember our cancer patients. Um, Rachel, as I said earlier, Pam, let's remember Jackie and so many others that are actually on this list. Uh, let's lift all them up. And um, so our friends and family day will be April the 28th. Um, ask everybody, let's do our part to try to fill this place. Uh, it, what, what an honor it would be to have a video set up in, in our community area over here because the place is so full. Uh, that's actually April the 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st. As Jeremy had mentioned, is our revival. Um, again, what a special time that is. Um, and as he mentioned, the two individuals that have uh, that have chose to to come and join Christ. Let's let's really pray for that that revival that we may have those individuals that uh, that may choose that that same route. If, uh, if nothing else, we'll have a song and closing prayer. Hope you all have a good week. Let's all stand. Sing the first verse and we all get to Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed. so grateful to be able to be here today to worship you. Lord, we're so grateful that you are our King, you are our Lord and our Savior. Lord, thank you for sending your Son down on the cross to die for us. Lord, we need to be thankful and remember that sacrifice daily, God. Because you are our King and you are our Savior more than just in this church building, but outside of those doors and every day and every part of our life, God. Lord, please be with all of those that are sick. Be with all the events going on, Lord, and, uh, that are going on in this church. Just be with them and over them, God. Lord, guide the people that are over these and, and these events and allow them to uh, 
make the make wise decisions and look to you for guidance for all of this. And Lord, let us always, let us all be able to look to you for guidance, Lord. Let us be the Christians you call us to be every single day. Every second of every single day and every decision we make, God, let us put you first and put you at the forefront of our mind. God, just continue to guide us and be with us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.